Chapter 18 of Preferred Risk by Edson McCann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The second day, the television went off the air with the final curt announcement that anyone not inside the clinics at noon would be left outside permanently. Then the set went dead, leaving only the clucking and beeping of our own radiation indicator. I'd thrown it out twice and brought it back both times. Civilization had ended on the third day, though all the conveniences in the villa went on smoothly, except for the meter reading that told us nothing could be smooth. It was higher than the predictions I had heard, though I still hoped that was only a sporadic local phenomenon that would level out later. In the face of that, it was hard to believe that even a few men would remain outside the clinics, though I was counting on it. We waited another twenty-four hours, forcing ourselves to sit in the villa discussing plans, when our nerves were yelling for action. We had only an estimate to go on. If we got there too soon, there would be more awake than we could handle. Too late, and we'd be radiation cases, good for nothing but the vaults. It was a relief to leave at last, taking our weapons in the truck. We were wearing the radiation suits, hoping they'd protect us, and Zorchi spent the last two days devising pads and straps to cushion and strengthen his developing legs. The world was dead. Cars had been abandoned in the middle of the road, making driving difficult. The towns and villas were deserted, boarded up or simply abandoned. We might have been the last men on earth, and we felt that we were, as we headed for Anzio. This wasn't just a road, or Naples, or all of Italy. It was the world. Then Raina pointed. Ahead, a boy was walking beside a dog, the animal's left rear leg bound and split as if it had been broken. I started to slow, then forced myself to drive on. As we passed, I saw the boy was about fourteen, and his face was dirty and tear-streaked. He shook one fist at us and came trudging on. "'If we win, we'll have the door open when he gets there,' Raina said for him and his dog. If not, it won't matter how long it takes him. You couldn't stop, Tom. It didn't make me feel any better. But now dusk was falling and we slowed, waiting until it was dark to park quietly near the garage. In front of the entrance, I could see a small ring of fires, and by their light, a few figures moving about. They were madmen, of course, and yet, probably less mad than others who must be prowling through the towns looting for things they never could use. It seemed incredible that anyone could be outside, but the psychologist had apparently been right. These were determined men, willing to wait for the forlorn chance that some miracle might give them a futile, even more forlorn chance to try battering down the great doors. Maybe somewhere in the world such a group might succeed. But not here. As I watched, there was a crackle of automatic gunfire from the entrance. The guards were awake all right, and not taking chances on any poor devil getting too close. There were no guards in the vault garage. We were prepared, in case someone might be stationed inside the private entrance. As much prepared as we could be. Since Carmody had been listed as still living, an ordinary guard who recognized him would probably let us in first and then try to report, giving us time to handle him. But we were lucky. The door opened to Carmody's top-secret combination. We designed such combinations into a few doors, in case of internal revolution locally while no underwriters were around. We never considered having an underwriter lead a revolution from outside, he whispered to us. The underground passage was deserted, and this time Carmody led through another corridor to a stairs that seemed to wind up forever. Zorchi groaned, then caught himself. "'It leads to the main reception room,' Carmody said. With the men outside, most of the guards who still remained awake might be there, but we had to chance it. We stopped when we reached the top catching our breath while Zorchi sank to the floor, writhing silently. Then Raina threw back the door, Zorchi's rifle poked through, and I was leaping for the main door controls, hoping the memory I had was accurate. 
I was nearly to them when the two guards standing beside them turned. They yelled just as my rifle spat. At that range I couldn't miss. And behind I heard Zorchi's gun spit. The second guard slumped sickly to the floor, holding his stomach. I grabbed for the controls while other yells sounded and feet began pounding toward me. There was no time to look back. The doors were slowly moving apart and Carmody was beside me, smashing a maul from the storeroom onto the electronic controls of the atomic cannon. I twisted between the opening doors. "'We've seized the vaults!' I shouted. "'We need help. Any man who joins us will be saved.' I couldn't wait to watch, but I heard a hoarse answering shout and the sound of feet. Carmody's maul had ruined the door controls, but the other guards were nearly on us. I saw two more sprawled on the floor. Zorchi hadn't missed. Then Carmody's fingers had found another of the private doors that looked like simple panels here. Reina and Carmody were through, and I yanked Zorchi after me just as a bullet whined over his head. Behind us, I heard uncontrolled yelling as men from outside began pouring in. It was our only hope. They had to take care of the guards, who were still probably shocked at finding us inside. We headed for the private quarters where Defoe would be, praying that there would only be a few there. This passage was useless to us, though. It led from office to office for the doctors who superintended here. We came out into an office, watching our chance for the hall we had to take. I could see the men who had been outside in action now. A few had guns of some kind, but the clubs in the hands of the others were just as deadly in such a desperation attack. Men who had seen themselves already dead weren't afraid of chances. About a score of the expediter guards were trying to hold off at least twice their number. Then the hall seemed clear, and we leaped into it. Suddenly gongs began ringing everywhere. Some guard had finally reached or remembered the alarm system. Carmody cursed and tried to move faster. The small private vault for the executives lay through the administration quarters and down several levels before it was entered through a short passageway. Carmody had mapped it for me often enough, but he knew it by physical memory which is better than my training. He'd also taught me the combination, but I left the doors to his practice fingers when we came to it. The elevator wasn't up. We couldn't wait. We raced down the stairs that circled it. Here, Carmody's age told against him, and he fell behind. Reina and I were going down neck and neck with Zorchi throwing himself along with us. He had dropped his rifle and picked up a submachine gun from one of the fallen guards, and he clung to it now, using only one hand on the rail. It was a reflection on a gun barrel that saved us. The picked expediters were hidden in the dark mouth of the passageway, waiting for us to turn the stairs. But I caught a gleam of metal and threw up my gun. Instantly, Zorchi was beside me, the submachine spitting as quickly as I could fire the first shot. Aim for the wall! Ricochet! The ambushers had counted too much on surprise. They weren't ready to have the tables turned, nor for the trick Zorchi had suggested. Here we couldn't fire directly, but the bouncing shots worked almost as well. There were screams of men being hit and the crazed pandemonium of others suddenly afraid. Shots came toward us, but the wall that protected them, or was supposed to, ruined their shooting. Sorchi abruptly dropped, landing with a thud on his side. I grunted sickly, thinking he was hit. Then I saw the submachine gun point squarely into the passageway. It began spitting out death. By the time we could reach him, the expediters were dead or dying. There had been seven of them. Zorchi staggered into the passage, through the bodies, crying something. I jumped after him, blinking my eyes to make out what he had seen. Then I caught sight of a door at the back being silently closed. It was a thick, massive slab, like the door to a bank vault. Zorchi made a final leap that brought a sob of anguish as he landed on his weak legs. But his gun barrel slapped into the slit of opening, 
The door ground against it, strained, and stopped. Zorchi pulled the trigger briefly. For a second, then, there was silence. A second later, Defoe's voice came out through the thin slit. You win. Dr. Lawton and I are alone and unarmed. We're coming out. The door began opening again, somewhat jerkily this time. I watched it, expecting a trick, but there was none. Inside the vault, the first room was obviously for guards and for the control of the equipment needed to wash all contamination out of the air and to provide the place with security for a century, even if all the rest of the earth turned into a radioactive hell. Lawton was slumped beside the controls, his head cradled in his arms. But at the sight of us he stood up groggily, his mouth open and shock on his face. Defoe's eyes widened a little, but he stood quietly, and the bleak smile never faltered. "'Congratulations, Thomas,' he said. "'My one fault again. I underrated the opposition. I wasn't expecting miracles. Hello, Millen. Fancy meeting you here.' "'Search the place,' I ordered. Carmody went past the two without looking at them, with Rena close behind. A minute later I heard a triumphant shout. They came back with a cringing man who seemed totally unlike the genial Sam Gogarty who had first introduced me to fine food and to Rena. His eyes were on Carmody, and his skin was gray-white. He started to babble incoherently. Carmody grinned at him. You've got things twisted, Gogarty. Tom Wills is in charge of this affair. He turned toward one of the smaller offices. As I remember it, there should be a transmitting set up in here. I want to make sure it works. If it does, some of the underwriters are going to get a surprise. Unless they're suspended. Gogarty watched him go and then sank slowly to a chair, shaking his head as he looked up at me. His lips twisted into bitter resignation. You wouldn't understand, Tom. All my life, worked for things. Class C, digging in a mine eating Class D, getting no fun, so I could buy Class B employment, then Class A. Not many can do it, but I sweated it out. Thirty years living like a dog and killing myself with work and study. Not even a real woman until I met Susan, and she went to Defoe. But I wanted it easier for the young men. I wanted everybody to have a good life, no harm to anyone. Pull together, and forget the tough times. Then you had to come and blow the roof off. I felt sick. It was probably all true, and few men could make it. But if that's what it took to advance under the company rules, it was justification enough for our fight. You'll be all right, Sam, I told them. You'll go to sleep with the others, and when you wake up, you may have to work like hell again, but it'll be to rebuild the earth, not to ruin it. Maybe there'll even be a chance with Susan again. Defoe laughed sardonically. <laughs> Very nice, Thomas. And I suppose you mean it. What's in the future for me? Suspension until the new government gets organized and can decide your case. I'd like to vote now for permanent suspension. His voice lost some of his amusement. Then he shrugged. All right. I suppose I knew that. But now will you satisfy my curiosity? Just how did you work the business with Bay 100? What happened to Slavetsky? I asked. I couldn't be sure about some of my suspicions over Benedetto's death, but I couldn't take chances that the man might still be loose somewhere, or else hiding out here until we were off guard. He shook his head. I can answer, but I'm waiting for a better offer. Sam? I asked. Gogarty nodded slowly. All right, Tom, I guess you're the boss now. And I think I'm even glad of it. I always liked you. I'll answer about Slavetsky. Defoe snarled and swung, then saw my rifle coming up and straightened again. You'll win once more, Thomas. Your great international rebel cooperated with us very nicely after we caught him. We arranged for him to receive all calls to his most secret hideout right here in this room. It netted us his fellow conspirators, including your father, Miss Delangela. She gasped faintly, but her head came up at once. 
Nicholas was no traitor. You're lying. Why should I lie? he asked. With the right use of certain drugs, any man can become a traitor. And Dr. Lawton is an expert on drugs. Where is he? I asked. He shrugged. How should I know? He wanted a radioactive world, so I let him enjoy it. We put him outside just before we closed the doors permanently. Gogarty nodded confirmation. I turned it over. He might even have been one of the men waiting outside. But it wouldn't matter. Without his organization, and with a world where life outside was impossible, Slavetsky's power was finished. I turned to Zorchi. The men who broke in will be going crazy soon, I told him. While Reyna finds the paging system and reassures them they'll all be treated in the reception room, how about getting Lawton to locate and revive a couple of the doctors you know and trust? Reyna came back from the paging system and Zorchi prodded Lawton with the gun, heading him toward the files that would show the location of the doctors. Gogarty stood up doubtfully, but I shook my head. Zorchi was able to handle a man of Lawton's type, even without full use of his legs, and I couldn't trust Gogarty yet. "'You can give me a hand with Defoe, Sam,' I suggested. "'We'd better strap him down first. Gogarty nodded, and then suddenly let out a shocked cry and was cringing back. In the split second, when both Reyna and I had looked away, Defoe had whipped out an automatic and was now covering us, his teeth exposed in a taut smile. Never underestimate an opponent, Thomas, he said, and never believe what he says. You should have searched me, you know. The gun was centered on Reyna and he waited as if expecting me to make some move. All I could do was stand there, cursing myself. I'd thought of everything, except the obvious. Defoe backed toward the door and slipped around it, drawing its heavy weight slowly shut until only a crack showed. Then he laughed. <laughs> Give my love to Millen, <laughs> he said, and laughed softly. I jumped for the door. But his feet were already moving out of the passage. The door began opening again, but I knew it was too late. Then it was open, and, amazingly, Defoe stood not ten feet away. At the other end of the passage, a ragged, bloody figure was standing, swaying slowly from side to side, holding a rifle. I took a second to recognize Nicholas Slavetsky. He was moving slowly toward Defoe. And now Defoe jerked back and began frantically digging for the automatic he must have pocketed. Slavetsky leaped, tossing the gun aside in a way that indicated it must have been empty. A bullet from Defoe's automatic caught his shoulder in mid-leap, but it couldn't stop him. He crashed squarely on Defoe, swinging a knife as the other went down. It missed, ringing against the hard floor. I'd come unfrozen by then. I kicked the knife aside and grabbed the gun from Defoe's hands. Slavetsky lay limp on him, and I rolled the smaller man aside. Defoe was out cold from the blow of his head hitting the floor. Gogarty had come out behind me and now began binding him up. He opened his eyes slowly, blinked, and tried to grin as he stared at the bonds. He swung his head to the figure on the floor beside him. "'Shall we go quietly, Nicholas?' he asked as Gogarty picked him up and carried him back to the private vault. But his sarcasm was wasted on Slavetsky. The man must have been dying as he stumbled and groped his way toward the place where he knew Defoe must be, and the bullet in the shoulder had finished him. Reyna bent over him, a faint sob on her lips. Surprisingly, he fought his way back to consciousness, staring up at her. Reyna, he said weakly, Benedetto! I loved him. I... Then his head rolled toward me. At least I lived to die in a revolution, Thomas. Dirty business revolution. When, in the course of human events, it becomes... He died before he could finish. I went looking for Lawton to make sure Defoe was suspended at once. He'd be the last political suspendee if I had anything to do with it. But there would be a certain pleasure in watching Lawton do the job. End of chapter 18